We have a vital, vital role now. This is a truly seismic moment in history. The big question, of course, is can we trust Boris? We must not let him sell this country down the river by reheating, rehashing, and repackaging the worst deal in history. That dreadful withdrawal treaty. Please welcome to the stage, Richard Tice. Welcome. Welcome to Doncaster Racecourse. It's fantastic to be here in the heart of Yorkshire and the Humber region. It really is great. It's wonderful to see so many people here. It's fair to say since the Brexit party launched, we've been quite busy. I hope you'll agree. In fact, we had our anniversary last Friday. I know we're a bit old. 20 weeks. <laughs> it's, um, now, and we really have pushed on a bit. Uh, 20 weeks ago, we launched in a family-run business, in a factory in Coventry, with our first six MEP candidates. Six weeks later, we had won a national election. Not only did we win it, <laughs> We got 50% more votes than any other political party. And this is the bit I really like. We got more votes than the Labour Party and the Conservative Party put together. And you all right, sir? And unbelievably, Hopefully the rest of the equipment will be better. Unbelievably, we became the biggest single political party in the whole of the European Parliament. And I think you'll agree, I hope you'll agree that we've made our presence felt. They're quite keen to get rid of us. Of course, we've actually been hired for a job that we want to be fired from as soon as possible. Because we want to get on with a much more important job, and that's getting ready for a general election. Now, we stood, of course, on a simple slogan of trust in democracy and changing politics for good. And we'll talk about it later, Nigel will talk about it later, but it's fair to say that the issue of trust in democracy has never, ever been more important than the shambles we're seeing in Parliament this week. Absolutely disgraceful. But, but we said we wanted to change politics for good, and having won that election, of course, there was some immediate good news. Theresa May resigned. Does anybody agree with me that she was without question, without any shadow of doubt, the worst Prime Minister this country's ever seen? Are you quite sure? And does anybody agree with me that she had the worst, least talented cabinet that this country had ever seen. Do we agree? We're making progress. So, so we got rid of them. That's a good start. Couldn't get any worse. So we'd made some progress. But then, of course, what followed? Well, we know what followed, don't we? Boris. Who trusts Boris? No. 
You sure? Does anyone trust Boris here? We're going to find out soon, aren't we? We're going to find out whether we trust Boris. But at the end of June, we held our big vision rally. It was the biggest political rally this country has seen for over 25 years. And we announced our first major policies. The first of which was to scrap that dreadful, wasteful thing, HS2. And now the truth is, the Tories, they've slightly run out of ideas. So they thought, well, why don't we just copy what the Brexit party's doing? That's fine. Imitation is a form of flattery. So all of a sudden, they've started talking about a review of HS2 with a view to cancelling it. And only this week, they said that it's going to be, take another five or seven years to complete. Why well, don't have the guts and the courage just to say, scrap the wretched thing? So that was our first policy. We also said that we weren't going to send 39 billion quid of our money, not government money, folks, it's our taxpayers' cash. And we're not going to send it to bungling bureaucrats in Brussels. And sure enough, the Tories, in their infinite wisdom, have now recently started talking about maybe not spending quite as much as 39 billion quid. So we talked about that. We then talked about investing in the regions that have been left behind. Because you know what? When we also don't send 50% of the foreign aid budget overseas, you end up at 200 billion quid. That's a lot of cash. You can do a huge amount with that. And we said we need to invest it in the regions that have been left behind, in local road and rail schemes that will make a real difference to real people's daily lives. And sure enough, sure enough, Boris, in his leadership cam Bor campaign, Boris then starts talking about investing in the regions. We said we wanted to invest in digital and broadband infrastructure and free Wi-Fi on all public transport. And you can imagine what the Tories did. Yeah, you got it. They copied it. <laughs> It's incredible, isn't it? We said we wanted an online sales tax to help regenerate the high streets and young businesses. And sure enough, recently the Tories are talking about an online sales tax. In fact, so short are they, are they of ideas, they've even started to copy the types of rallies we do and our own videos. It's quite extraordinary. So we're making progress. We're changing politics for good. And now, of course, it gets even more serious. Because I touched earlier on the need to trust in democracy, the need to get ready for a general election. We've all known it's coming, and it feels as though it's right round the corner. In fact, it could even be called sometime this week or next week. Who knows? Nigel will talk about that later. But we've been getting ready. We've been working hard massively hard in the office. We had 3,000 applications to be prospective parliamentary candidates. Every one of them was looked at by two people. We interviewed over 1,400 people, and we've therefore got over 600 approved, vetted, interviewed candidates. And it's fantastic to be able to know that about 30 are here tonight, standing here in the region of Yorkshire and the Hummer. Please stand up on your feet. Give them a massive round of applause. Now, thank you very much. It's, the truth is, the vast majority of our candidates, they've never stood for public office before. And there's a reason for that. They're real people successful people, achievers, doers. They've been around the block a few times. They might have earned a few quid. They might have employed a few people. What I can tell you is they're not pretty perfect policy wonks from Westminster. And I... Nigel and I, we salute their courage because it can be pretty tough putting your head above the parapet. If you stand for the Brexit party, it comes 
you know, it just comes with a bit of grief. There's good days, there's bad days, there's highs, there's lows, but it takes real courage. They will have had serious discussions with their partners, their families, and I really do salute that courage. Thank you very much. <clears throat> And I know we don't want to think about Theresa May, but just imagine if the Brexit party didn't exist. Not only would she still be Prime Minister, heaven forbid, we'd probably be in the middle of a second referendum campaign as we speak. A terrifying thought. But instead, we face a general election. And we've got a short video talking about the experiences of just some of the candidates that are standing for the Brexit party, hopefully on the screen. In just a few months, the Brexit party has some amazing achievements. We've reset the political agenda, got rid of a hopeless prime minister and made the option of a clean break Brexit the most popular one in the country. But now we face our biggest challenge, to fight a general election across the entire United Kingdom. And we are ready. 54% of people of Leicester East feel like they don't have a voice. So I'm here to give them that voice. There's a lot of people that I've spoken to that said they're never going to vote again because how can you trust the political system now? People just want common sense, people like them representing them. And that's where the Brexit party is firmly positioning itself. It's just a party of regular people like myself um, who want to get involved because we care and then make sure that this, this sort of betrayal can never happen again. People voted for something completely new, you know, voted to go out into the unknown and try something completely different and, and reclaim power back. We all have a stake in it and I'm one of those people. Even though I'm an ordinary person on Exmoor, uh, running the Exmoor Pony Project, living an ordinary life, I just felt that I had to be part of it. We've stepped up because we simply have to defend our and safeguard our democracy and, and we're here. From what I've seen, a lot of the um, Brexit PPCs now are just from normal backgrounds, uh, just working class people who care about people as well. I think there's a lot of commonality between a politician and a doctor. Consultation always begins with listening. You listen to what the person has to say, take on board and then help them and make them realise that actually they've got control. They've got, they've got the power to decide their future and what to do and what not to do and they're not helpless. I'm just a normal, hard-working, uh, working-class person. But I think the taxi driving has given me an insight of how people live and um, you get to learn their issues and you become their agony aunt. I tell the taxi driver everything. I am ready. I'm ready. I am ready. I'm definitely ready. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> We have an extraordinary cross-section of people from every walk of life making a stand for democracy. They will be our candidates at the forthcoming general election. And we are ready. We are ready. Are you ready? Are you ready? That's great, because I'm telling you, this is the battle of our lives. We had a battle in the Europeans, but this is oh so much more serious. Oh so much more serious. When Parliament is now completely and utterly betraying democracy. They voted today, extraordinarily, for a very short bill. And basically that bill is to take the option of a clean break Brexit off the table. Would any of you, would any of you walk into a car showroom with your partner and say to the salesman, I want to buy that car, how much? And whatever the price he says, you're just saying, I'm not going to leave the room until I've bought the car. Well, the car salesman is going to think, it's Christmas come early. The price is going to go up. That's what these foolish, clowns in Westminster have done today. They've said, <laughs> you 
Not only have they taken a clean break Brexit off the table, they've said that they'll leave the decision as to how long to extend our time in the European Union, not to ourselves, no, 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 they've given that decision to the European Union, seriously. So the European Union could say, I tell you what, folks, could you stay for another five or ten years? And that's what they could do, and there'll be nothing that we could do about it unless we repeal this terrible, terrible bill that's going through Parliament. And Nigel will talk about that later. So we've got this massive battle. We've got to be ready. It's going to be hugely hard work and challenging, but we're ready, and we've got some of the most talented candidates that I believe have ever stood for public office. Canvassing, leafleting, we're going to need all your work, all your hard work, efforts, your friends, your family. This is so, so important. And we've got a great lineup of speakers, including two of the prospective candidates for this region. But our first next speaker is someone who is a member of the European Parliament for Yorkshire and the Humber for the Brexit Party. She's an absolute passionate, energetic, hard-working Brexiteer. I mustn't say she was a professional opera singer because I'll have upset the opera community, but she was a semi-professional opera singer um, in her former life. She then set up a great organization called Leavers of Britain. Please give a massive welcome, Lucy Harris. Please welcome to the stage, Lucy Harris. Now, I'm one of those strange people that's a young person who voted for Brexit. Yes, we do exist. Now, I absolutely hate the term young person. I much prefer young adult. And the reason for that is because it emotes responsibility. It rem promotes equality amongst other adults. I hate this term, young person. But how can we be responsible adults? if we are still financially dependent and trapped in debt. And I'm sure many of the people here know what I mean by being financially dependent, often on our parents. Um, we are trapped in debt currently because the Lib Dems, back when they had a coalition with the Tories, upped our tuition fees by over £28,000 at least, which meant it was an increase in the interest that we had, which dragged us down. We can't allow that. And that is why the Brexit Party have decided to wipe away the interest on student loans, which will free up. Thank you. It's a great idea. It is absolutely fantastic. And not only, and not only have they decided to wipe away that interest, They've decided to bring it down to £7,500 a year. I'm sure the Lib Dems wouldn't like that. After the students had trust them not to put it up, they did it anyway. But hell, the Liberal Democrats are nor Liberal nor Democrats. So we can't trust them. Now, this money frees up young adults to save for a house, to save for something that actually invests in them as individuals. And it would, I hope with this freedom, this ability to stand on one's own two feet, will get them to think about what really matters in life. I hope that they will reject Labour's plan on creating factories of mediocrity in our education system. And I sincerely hope they reject the centrist. And may I quote Alistair Campbell and his, <laughs> our friend Alistair Campbell, and may I quote his bog standard comprehensive. I hope they reject that. And above all, I hope that young adults reject the idea that they have to go to university, that they have a need to go to university. And I hope they reject it because they don't want to be merely a number pushed through the system with a worthless degree at the end of it. Now, now, 
my degree, as Richard has touched on, was in music. Now, music is a lot of fun, but it doesn't pay the bills at the end of the day. And what I found that was the biggest experience in my life was taking a job as a fishmonger for five years in my local Waitrose as I did that degree. I learned so much more from talking to the general public, understanding what they're about, understanding what they wanted. Was it a sea bass? Was it a tilapia? It doesn't matter. Understanding what they wanted. And it really got into the idea of what it meant to be to be part of a community. And I'm trying to say to people my age and people who are younger, that you don't have to follow the same road. You don't have to be part of the mould. I hope that you have the confidence to go out there and build yourselves as individuals, as ordinary people who can crack the mould and be something different than to what a government or a state system will tell you you can be. You can be someone else and you can be different. I reject the, pater the paternalism of the EU. I reject the idea of a nanny state. I reject being told what to do. And I hope young adults my age will understand the importance and the freedom that lies behind rejecting so much control over every aspect of our lives. the approval of anyone to be successful in our own lives. Be rebellious. Question those in power, not yourself. Question the status quo, not yourself. Question the mainstream, not yourself. Be rebellious. Vote for the Brexit party. Brilliant. Isn't it great? Thank you, Lucy. That's fantastic. And I said that we had some of our prospective candidates. And our next speaker is a candidate here in Doncaster, who's going to hopefully get rid of Ed Miliband. So please give a huge welcome. <coughs> Please give a huge welcome to Sergit Dure. Richard, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm uh, very flattered that uh, the Brexit party has, uh, out of all the candidates, has considered my merits, my qualities, and selected me. And I hope to serve Doncaster Central as to the best of my ability. I do want to mention that um, I'm one of the 70% that voted to leave in Doncaster, as vast majority of you did too. In simple terms, let's now just do it. Instead of talking about it, as you know, Richard mentioned the, the bill that's gone through. As a Yorkshireman, I worked hard and I played hard and I put something back into the community that I'm part of. I work with young people and crime prevention, and I work throughout the community providing the facilities. I've been, my children will confirm, a nappy changer and a nappy seller. I've been a, tr I've been a market trader. I've been a taxi driver. I've been a teacher. I've been a bank manager. And now I'm an interpreter at law. So I have a vast experience to offer to you, Mike. But 
as a, an ex-Labour and Momentum member, I felt it's a change. I've changed. I've seen the light. I, I'm stood here today because of one individual and his principles. And I told him as much earlier on. I said, Nigel, you're the reason. You are the reason why I've come to join the party. And what can I say? Thank you for coming to support our event. Thank you. Well <laughs> Thank you, Sergit. A high quality candidate standing here in Doncaster. We will get rid of Ed Miliband, but I'll just correct. <coughs> Serge is going to stand for Central, and we're going to get rid of. Some, we've got someone else to get rid of that dreadful man, Ed Miliband. <laughs> so, to our next speaker, <clears throat> to our next speaker, who's also standing here in Yorkshire, in Leeds. She's just recently graduated. She's incredibly brave, committed, sparky, passionate about Brexit. Please give a massive welcome to Anaya Falarin Iman. My name is Anaya and I'm standing for Leeds North East and I'm so grateful for this opportunity. I joined the Brexit party because I am fundamentally fed up of more of the same. The same ideas, the same lies, the same deceit, corruption and complacency. <laughs> The same political and economic elite whose sole interest is to fatten their pockets and to feather their nests to the detriment of everybody else. We've seen the gradual erosion of democracy and the selling off of our future to the highest bidder. As a 22 year old, my generation will inherit the decisions made today for the longest of time frames. And thus, we must stand up and claim our seat on the decision-making table. Young people, all people, must stand up and be counted and take power back. Yeah. Brexit has tapped into the civic revolutionary spirit that has been bumbling under the surface of British society for decades. And it's time to harness and transform that spirit into material realization. Let's educate and inspire our young, empower our communities, invest in our industries, and build an economy rooted in responsibility to the people and the planet. We are ready. We are absolutely and completely ready. Change is possible and change for good. Thank you. <laughs> Done. Brilliant. A few. Isn't she great? Thank you, Anna. That's absolutely wonderful. So encouraging to hear that enthusiasm, that desire to change politics for good. And to our next speaker is an entrepreneur, a businessman. He was the Director General of the British Chambers of Commerce until he resigned during the referendum campaign because he has the cheek, working for a, a big corporate lobbying group, he had the cheek to suggest that we should leave. That took some courage, some guts and some bravery, and ever since, he has worked tirelessly, passionately, for the cause of Brexit. He's also an MEP here for Yorkshire and the Humber. Please give a massive welcome, John Longworth. Please welcome to the stage, John Longworth. Is this 
mic working? Somebody say, is this mic working? Can you hear? Okay, on the way here, I'd passed Yvette Cooper's constituency. And I'm told that from this race course, I can see Caroline Flint's constituency. I would suggest that those two ladies carry out a farewell tour before it's too late. Back in, back in, back in November 2015, long time ago, when I was still head of the Chambers of Commerce, I was invited along to the German Embassy for a dinner. It was one of a series of dinners that the Embassy was running at that time, and amongst the guests was the head of the Institute of Directors, a very senior Tory MP, a Liberal peer, and a very senior Labour MP. And also, believe it or not, an editorial director of the BBC. Now, they obviously got it a bit wrong inviting me along because they clearly didn't understand where I was coming from. I sat in silence for most of that evening because I was completely, jaw-droppingly gobsmacked because the entire discussion led by the German ambassador was how they could collude to stop Brexit. And I say this because there's been a lot of talk from these rubbish MPs we've got in Parliament about the fact that they, they support Britain and they support democracy. Well, let me tell you, if somebody colludes with a foreign power, as far as I'm concerned, they do not believe in Britain. And they're still doing it. And if we give away our sovereignty, to the European Union, if we stay in rather than having a clean break Brexit, we will find that certainly in my children's lifetime, Britain no longer exists. It will be a province of a European superstate. And you know, if we leave, we'll be so much more prosperous. We've already heard about the 39 billion pounds and the policies that the Brexit party have to have a cash fund to boost the regions, to actually provide wealth for the regions, not welfare. But there's so much more resource that's available to us. That 39 billion is more, more than was given to Britain in the Marshall Plan after World War II to rebuild after the war. More than was used to build the entire NHS. It's a huge amount of money. But we'll also have nine billion pounds net contribution that we'll get back from the European Union every single year to cut business and personal taxes. We'll also be able to remove tariffs. These are the taxes that we pay to the EU on goods coming in to our country. These are things that are the most regressive taxes in the country because they affect the poorest the most. Because those taxes are 20% on average on food and children's clothing and footwear and flat screen TVs, most of which we do not produce in Britain. And yet we pay that tax on stuff coming in and it goes straight into the pockets of Brussels. And who, and, and who supports this? The Labour Party. The party who are for the few and not the many. Because it's designed to support fat cat manufacturers, multinationals who are monopolistic and landowners in continental Europe. How could you possibly support a policy like that if you believe in the people of Britain? So we've got all that money that could come to us as well. We've got a huge fund of repeatable money coming into the UK which we can use to boost all the things that we want, all the infrastructure, and actually regenerate British industry in the regions, which will be the biggest single thing that will provide wealth and not welfare, because it will provide high paid jobs and actually generate wealth for this country. The, the, so, the sort of policies that have been completely ignored for decades now by the mainstream parties. And you know, if our currency goes down a little bit for a while, in fact, we'll have a job keeping it down because the fact is, when Britain booms, 
people will want to buy pounds, but we'll have to try and keep it down because that will be the biggest single thing that will regenerate the regions because we will boost our exports so much. And all, all this nonsense that's talked about automobiles and the problem that we'll have if, the, if we leave for the UK automobile industry. Just think of this. If we have tariffs on German and French cars, people will buy British cars instead, won't they? And if we, if we remove the tariffs on those cars, the, our cars will still be cheaper because the pound for a time will actually be of a lower value. So we'll still win. And this is why the Germans and the French are so terrified. Because whichever way it goes, we win and they lose. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of a clean break Brexit. Because not only is it not a problem, not only is it complete nonsense to say we'll have shortages, because after all, how could we have shortages unless our own government stopped stuff coming in? Why would they do that? Don't be afraid of a clean break Brexit. On the contrary, a clean break Brexit will make us more wealthy and it will actually make the regions like Yorkshire and North Lincolnshire boom again. Thank you. Thank you, John. And as John quite rightly said, we shouldn't be afraid of a clean break Brexit. We should be excited by it. It's the greatest opportunity to maximise Brexit. What we should be afraid of is Boris. Because Boris, just recently, he wrote to Donald Tusk and he said, if you can get rid of the backstop, then the rest of it would probably be satisfactory and we could get it through Parliament. Rubbish. Rubbish. You're quite right, sir. Let's just remind ourselves because hopefully everyone's had a good summer holiday and it's easy to forget the detail of this truly the worst ever deal in history. Even without the backstop, let's just remind ourselves why it is such a shocking deal. Firstly, we'd have to pay 39 billion, not for anything in return, no, 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 just for the right for a chat. Secondly, we'd still be subject to the European Court of Justice. Thirdly, we'd be in a transition period. Now the politicians, the trustworthy politicians in Parliament, they say it'll be for 14 months. Forget that, they've got the right to extend it for another couple of years. Over three years transition, during which time the EU could literally plunder and pillage our fishing waters off the coast here. That is a disgrace. Because taking back control of our fishing waters is one of the greatest opportunities to regenerate our coastal communities from Brexit. And that's why we want to get on with it. And then we wouldn't have left the customs union. No, no, no. We'd still be tied up in that dreadful thing. So we couldn't reduce tariffs. We couldn't change our rules and regulations to get rid of daft rules. No, no, we couldn't do any of that. And we couldn't even sign any new trade deals with other countries around the world. So there's just, it really is a shockingly, shockingly bad deal. Worse than that, we would, we've signed up to a thing called the Common Foreign and Security Policy, which means that we would basically, in our foreign policy decisions, we would have to follow and do exactly what the EU says to do with third countries and to do with international organisations. That is another form of complete and utter surrender. And then finally, they say, oh, don't worry, we can negotiate a new trade deal once we've gone into, uh, once we've signed this withdrawal agreement. But there's a bogey clause in this withdrawal agreement. I know I'm sad, I actually remember the number. It's clause 184, remember that because that's the clause that ties the New Deal to this terrible withdrawal agreement. That is the clause that basically says everything in the new treaty would basically have to follow from the withdrawal agreement. So we wouldn't be able to leave the customs union. We wouldn't be able to cut prices for things that we don't produce in this country. It is truly the worst deal in history and we must, must not let Boris and his members of parliament 
in Westminster be tempted to sign this terrible, terrible deal. That is the battle ahead. It's massive, it's serious, but there's some good news. The good news is there is no better person in this country to lead this battle than the person who has been fighting for Brexit for over 25 years. Nigel, of course, is the person we have to thank that there was a referendum in the first place. It's thanks, it's thanks to Nigel that we won the referendum. And it's thanks to Nigel that we have a Brexit party. And before we welcome him, I said we've been working hard, and Nigel has been working incredibly hard. You may have heard, therefore, um, his voice suffered a little bit in recent days, but it's back on the mend. So before we welcome him to the stage to, to talk about where we are with the political strategy, the electoral strategy of being ready for whatever Parliament throws at us, let's just look at Nigel on the video. It's extraordinary to think that back in March of this year, all seemed lost from a Brexit perspective. We had a Labour and Conservative Party, both of whom were happy not to take us out of the European Union. And I felt that something absolutely fundamental had broken. Trust in politics, trust in our entire political system, and that is why I founded the Brexit Party, to restore that faith. What we've done already is we have completely reset the political agenda in this country, so much so that a clean break Brexit on the 31st of October is now by far the most popular option in this country. Please welcome to the stage, Nigel Farage. Good evening, Doncaster. Well, you sound in better voice than I am at the moment, but never mind. I've, uh, I've been to Doncaster several times. Four years ago, I came to Doncaster, and I was invited to go to a working man's club in the constituency of one Ed Miliband. So I went into this working man's club. It was an afternoon. Channel 4 Racing was on, a few of the chaps were there having a bet. I, for once, allowed myself to have a pint. <laughs> and then perhaps another one, I don't know. But what was really interesting, talking to those people in the club and the man that ran it, was that just 300 yards down the road was the constituency office for Ed Miliband. So I said to the owner of the Working Man's Club, I said, well, I expect you see a lot of Ed, Ed Miliband in here, don't you? He said, no, he's never, ever been in here once. And I thought then, I thought then, and I think now, it just goes to show that the Labour Party is now totally and utterly disconnected from its northern roots, its people and its voters. And it's that Labour Party who, as we speak, are in Westminster doing everything they can to stop Brexit from happening, doing everything they can to stop us even having a general election, 
before the 31st of October. And this is the party that was founded, was set up to represent the thoughts, hopes and aspirations of ordinary people through the democratic process. The Labour Party now is traducing our traditions, our democracy, our nation, the way the rest of the world looks at us. The Labour Party today and its actions in the House of Commons are a complete, total disgrace. And of course, this is the same Labour Party who said, however you vote in the general election, we will respect the vote, and if we're in government, we will implement the result. It's the same Labour Party who voted en masse for Article 50 to be triggered, which said, we will leave the European Union on the 29th of March with or with a deal. That's what they voted for. 500 MPs voted for it. Labour going through those lobbies too. It's the Labour Party who stood in the general election saying they would implement Brexit and respect the result. And that Labour Party now that wants to have a second referendum because they think that you voters here in South Yorkshire didn't know what you were voting for. So please, can you tell Jeremy Corbyn, did you know what you voted for? I think you probably did. We voted to leave, didn't we? It wasn't conditional. We didn't vote for a deal. We voted to leave. It's as simple as that. And the Labour Party now wants that second referendum. The Labour Party thinks that you are stupid. The Labour Party thinks they know better. And it's a Labour Party now completely and utterly dominated from London. It's a party that represents Islington and not his loin. It's a party that represents Hampstead and not Huddersfield, Dalston and not Doncaster. That's the Labour Party of today. <laughs> however, much, however much the Conservatives have failed since 2016, and I'm coming back to the Conservative Party, don't worry. But it is the Labour Party that have brazenly betrayed five million of their own voters. And here we are in South Yorkshire, where 80% of the constituencies voted by more than 60% to leave the European Union. And it's a South Yorkshire where virtually every seat has been Labour for decade after decade, they have taken your votes for granted. Yes. Now, as for, as for the Labour Party trying to stop us having a general election on this issue, all I can say is if they really do prevent us having a general election, we will have to organise in London and have a march for democracy yes. in protest about it. But in the end, in the end, they can't stop it. They may stop it before the 31st of October. But in the end, there is a general election coming and it isn't very far away. It will happen. And if you look here in South Yorkshire, this Labour heartland, if you look at how astonishingly well the brand new Brexit party which I think is one of the best ideas I've ever had in politics. <laughs> but if you look at how we did in under six weeks, topping the poll in seat after seat here in South Yorkshire, you know 
that when this general election comes, there is only one party, only one party can challenge Labour in South Yorkshire. Only one party that will stand up for the principles that the people of this, of this area voted for when they voted to leave in the referendum. Only one party that can win in this Labour heartland against Labour. And it's not the Conservative Party, it's not the Liberal Democrats, it's not even, it's, it's the Brexit Party. And I think we can do it. I've been today, I've been in South Yorkshire, I've been in North Lincolnshire, just at random meeting ordinary people who looking at the shenanigans that are going on in our parliament are truly disgusted at the way our political class are behaving. They really are, they're disgusted. So I think we can win and I'll come back in a minute to how I think we can do it. A Remainer Parliament has done its best to stop Brexit from happening. And it's constant fear stories, isn't it? You know, I mean, John has dealt, I know, with some of that this evening. I mean, ludicrous stories, like we might run out of fuel, when actually the oil that comes into this country comes from non-EU members, comes by ship, and none of it comes into Dover. It's nonsense. They tell us we'll all be poorer. They are trying to scare us into submission. They did it before. They told us if we didn't join the Euro, it would be a disaster. And remember what the Chancellor of the Exchequer, George Osborne, told us. He's worth the boo, I agree with that. <laughs> he told us that half a million jobs would be lost immediately. And now three years on, Employment is at record levels in this country. <laughs> so we're not going to listen to the negativity. We're not going to listen to the fear. We know, we know that this is a great country, that we are a great people, and that we have, through the Commonwealth and our friendship, with the United States of America. There are 2.7 billion people out there in the English-speaking countries of the world. They're our friends, they're our allies, they stand beside us in times of trouble. And Brexit, Brexit far from cutting us off, Brexit actually gives us a chance to re-engage with a bigger and more exciting world whilst putting at the same time the priorities of British people first. That's what a British government should do. Always, always. So we had the referendum and we got a new Prime Minister, didn't we, back in 2016? We got Theresa May. Now, I think she will go down as the worst Prime Minister in British history and perhaps the most dishonest and duplicitous as well. Because she lined us up. She lined us up for what they call the withdrawal agreement, what they call Mrs May's deal. And it's no such thing. It's a new European treaty, a legally binding new European treaty, which even if the backstop was going to be taken out, which of course now it won't, as the threat of no deal has receded with the vote in the House of Commons. But even if the backstop was taken out, it's the worst deal in history. It costs us 39 billion. It still leaves a foreign court ruling over us. It doesn't get us free of the customs union. And thank goodness there were a few brave people in Parliament who stood up and voted it down. Now, Boris has taken over. And Boris, to be fair, has brought some optimism and some energy to the job. I mean, nobody could be as miserable as she was. <laughs> oh. Well, very good insomnia cure, listening to a lot of her speeches, I suppose. But, but Boris, I'm afraid, is going in the wrong direction. Because Boris wrote a letter 
to Donald Tusk on the 19th of August in which he said, getting a withdrawal agreement is our highest priority. So Boris, whilst threatening to leave with what he, with what he calls no deal, can we stop calling it no deal? Can we call it what it is? It's a clean break Brexit. And that's what it is, a clean break Brexit. We will be, if we leave without those ties, an independent, self-governing, democratic nation. And I ask you, what price freedom? It's the right thing to do. It is remarkable that in just 20 weeks, that we have been launched as a party, that we already have 630 candidates ready to fight the general election as and when it comes this year. And you've seen the calibre, the quality and the passion of the people that we've attracted here on this stage today. So be in no doubt, Westminster, be in no doubt, we are ready. We are ready to take them on in a general election. But if Boris, <coughs> if Boris sees the light, and if Boris realises that the only way we are going to get Brexit, because we're not going to get a decent deal, we're not going to amend this withdrawal agreement, we haven't got time in 57 days to negotiate a simple trade deal, which frankly is all we wanted from the start. The, if Boris realises that the only way to deliver this is to go for a clean break Brexit, then we would, forgetting whether we come from a Labour background or a Conservative background, because this doesn't matter. Getting Brexit is the defining issue of our age. It really is. And I would make this offer to Boris Johnson. If you're threatened by the rise of the Liberal Democrats in the southwest of England, if you're going for a clean break Brexit, we would not stand candidates against you in the southwest of England. We would put our shoulder to the wheel and help you beat the Remainer Liberal Democrats. But there is a quid pro quo, and that is that here in South Yorkshire, where the Conservatives have never won in most of these seats and will never win in most of these seats, you step aside so that we can campaign for a clean break Brexit. They say that it's always darkest before dawn. And certainly, if you look at the BBC every day, it's pretty depressing. <laughs> but actually, there's a way out of this. But it needs Johnson to recognise that clean break is the only way. It needs Johnson to recognise that we in the Brexit party would work with anybody. We'd work with the Labour Party if they were the ones saying the right thing, but they're not. They're saying the wrong thing. We, in a general election this year, would be prepared to put country before party. We are prepared to do the right thing. And if it happens, and I sense it might be edging a bit nearer, because now that Boris has just sacked 21 of his own team, and by the way, well done him for having the guts to do it. My word. Politics is, 
Politics is changing. An audience in Doncaster clapped Boris Johnson. It's remarkable. <laughs> but we even had, in the European elections, I went to a former miners' club in Featherstone, and, <laughs> and Anne Widdecombe got a standing ovation. And, and that's because it doesn't matter anymore. Labour and Conservative are old hat. We are now leavers or remainers. They are the divisions in British politics. I, I, want to thank, I want to thank those of you that had the faith and confidence to get behind, to help and to vote for a brand new party. You did it in those May European elections. It's something that has never happened in the history of British politics. And you did it not because you believed in us. You did it because you believed in yourselves. You did it because you believe in our great nation. You did it because you want us to be a free, independent democracy. And we won! And I think whatever tricks they play in Westminster, whatever dishonesty we see, actually what I've seen is the opinion polls are clear. If you give people a choice for a clean break Brexit, or what the Labour Party want, which is to extend Article 50 and have a second referendum, there is a massive, massive majority for a clean break Brexit. If we do that deal, if we can do that deal with Johnson, if we leave the Brexit Party free to stand in the traditional Labour heartlands like this, we will win a crushing victory at the general election. We will get Brexit and we will get our country back. How about that? You can never keep a good man down, that is for sure. And Nigel is ready, and we are ready for whatever comes at us. Now, we've just got time for a few questions. And the first one I'm going to ask for John. It's from Barbara from Doncaster. And she quite rightly says, how can it be justified to just forget about democracy and forget about us Leave voters who won the referendum? Well, it's totally unjustifiable, isn't it? I mean, it's quite remarkable that the day after the referendum, I actually thought we were leaving the European Union. Uh, it didn't take me long, by the way, along with Richard, to set up leave means leave, because we thought, actually, the establishment were going to fight tooth and nail to stop us. And the, first, the very first newspaper article I wrote after resigning from the British Chambers was for the Evening Standard. They never asked me to write one again, by the way, because... <laughs> It's such a remain paper. Uh, but the article was called, Is This the New Peasants' Revolt? And I was really referring to what had happened in medieval times where the peasants revolted and what Tyler, the leader of the revolt, trusted, trusted the king to keep his word. And for his trouble, he got his throat cut. And I said at the end of the article, we must beware. This was in March 2016. We must beware because the establishment are ruthless in pursuit of their own vested interests. And so they have proved to be. I, um, I was in Lincoln this morning, and I went to visit the new Bomber Command Museum that's been put up there in the last couple of years. And it's a pretty humbling place. Humbling in terms of the massive sacrifice that was made. Scary in terms of the realisation what total war meant for ordinary people in this country, in Germany, and around much of the world. But I did think to myself, as I walked through that memorial garden, looking at all the names you know, of people that Bomber Command had lost 
including women, of course, who worked on bases that have been bombed, all of those things. When you talk, sir, in your question about democracy, what right do we have to throw away the massive sacrifice that those before us made for us to live in democracy? What right does anybody have to do that? So, and Philip from Leeds asks a really good question, and this is important. Are we going to split the vote by voting for the Brexit party in a Brexit seat? So that's for Nigel. I mean, the point is, the point is, if Boris Johnson sticks to this idea that his highest priority is to get an amendment to reheat Mrs May's appalling sell-out deal, then we're not splitting any vote, are we? We're not splitting any vote. Look, let's be clear. Without the Brexit party, we will never get a meaningful Brexit. If the others, if the Conservatives, are bright enough to recognise that we have great strength in this country and that if just for one general election we work together to get Brexit delivered, we won't split the vote, we'll smash the Labour opposition and win a big majority. Yes, we can. Yes, we yeah, can. That's right. yeah. And Wendy from Barnsley, she quite rightly says, we're concerned about the legislation that would take no deal off the table. I talked about it earlier. It's the most ludicrous absurd negotiating strategy that you would ever, ever hear. And so Wendy quite rightly asks, what are we doing about it? Well, you've heard from Nigel and the speakers today. We've got ready, we're getting ready, we are ready for whatever this ludicrous, anti-democratic bunch of MPs in Westminster throw at this country. So let's all, before we finish, let's all be upstanding and send a very clear message with your placards in the air. Are we ready? Yes! Are we ready? Yes!